Welcome, folks. I'd like to acknowledge the president of the statewide elected, Mr. Ted Wheeler, and uh, ask that you give him a round of applause. So a couple quick announcements. Uh, I want to correct a remark I made uh, an announcement last week, is that we don't have a weekly newsletter, but we do have a weekly email uh, blast that goes out to remind you of some of the great programs we've got coming up. I want to make sure that the next holiday was at Veterans Day. Um, we're planning not to meet unless somebody's got a burning program that you have to see here. Otherwise, we're going to take a week off. And uh, we have another statewide elected, uh, Ms. Ellen Rosenblum, coming up uh, next month. Uh, I've really got to thank Mr. John McWilliams for booking some outstanding speakers. I think he's done an amazing job. And uh, the, yes, have some applause. Uh, just a plea to the forum body, I want to let you know that we're always looking for volunteers and we can use that for people doing uh, uh, messaging, uh, phone calls, uh, website updates. There's a number of things you can step up and help out. Uh, you can even show up early and help us set up for uh, this event that we have live on uh, TV and uh, rebroadcast on cable access. I'd like to close my remarks out with uh, a technology upgrade that the forum has uh, just made. Uh, one of our partners is Google, YouTube, and we get these programs up for free on the internet. That organization has just updated their standards. Behind me is uh, hidden a TV and it uh, has something called 1080 resolution. That means that there's uh, 1,080 lines of resolution. Google now allows us to uh, put the stuff out on the internet at a resolution of 1440, which is, well, a magnitude, an order of, uh, of resolution higher in quality. So what I think is just horrific is that when I look at my own face on that, I see little hairs that are sticking out of place. <laughs> and I find it really awkward. On the other hand, I think that it's great that we're uh, keeping up with technology, and these are just uh, uh, you know, things that aren't costing the forum anything. And for us to maximize that is just really amazing. So, uh, with that being said, I'd ask for another round of applause for Mr. Ted Wheeler. I probably shouldn't have started clapping until I knew it was for me. That's too bad. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I appreciate it. This is a great forum, good people. I know some of you. Uh, and uh, I just appreciate the fact that you're interested in public policy issues and you're willing to spend a lunch discussing it. Uh, John, thank you for the invitation. It's true. He does invite interesting people to come here and speak, but he also invited me, and I appreciate that. Now, uh, as your state treasurer, there are a number of issues I could talk about, and some of them are more interesting than others. And I think what I'll do is go off of my prepared remarks. Uh, somebody approached me as I came into the room and said, are you going to talk about something you talked about two weeks ago? And I think I will, because I think it's an issue that's going to be important for you. So you're lucky I'm not going to talk about bond collateralization strategies, because uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. I thought that would be interesting, right? That would be interesting for everybody. And there's plenty of coffee. Uh, I want to talk to you instead uh, about something I've been feeling of late. And I don't know why I've been feeling it. Maybe it's the onset of my midlife crisis, uh, and I blame AARP for that because they sent me a card when I turned 50 years old inviting me to join AARP. And it's a great organization, uh, but I wasn't really mentally ready to receive that card. But it had an unintended positive consequence, and that unintended positive consequence was it's made me start thinking. It's not just the card. It's not just that I am now uh, firmly implanted in a part of my life where I can't say I'm young anymore. Uh, and I'm at a point where I'm watching my daughter grow older by the minute, it seems. I mean, she keeps growing and growing and growing. And I'm starting to have this nagging feeling and the nagging feeling isn't about my career. It's not one of these, is this all there is moments. Uh, it's a nagging feeling about what are we leaving behind? What are we leaving behind? What's the legacy? And I think I can say without offending anybody in this room, uh, you're all smart people, we're on the older side of the spectrum, so we're all thinking about the same thing, I hope. I think we're all thinking about the legacy. What are we going to leave for future generations? And what does that mean? There's one issue 
that has been on my mind more than any other for the last year or so. And it's a tough issue, and I want to start by acknowledging that. It's the issue of rapidly growing income disparity. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to be clear, when people hear that, they start thinking, oh gosh, here we go, here comes a partisan speech on income disparity. It isn't that. That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. Uh, I, like you, care deeply about this community, I care deeply about this country, and I care about where we've been, and I care about where we are headed. And I want to make sure that my profound optimism in this country is justified. And this issue of rapidly growing income disparity seems to be working counter to my optimism for the future. I want to walk into this a little bit slowly so you know where I'm coming from. This recession, which we're still feeling today, started about five and a half years ago, as you know, and it started on Wall Street. And as treasurer, I'll tell you, I think there are three things that caused it. I think the first was way too much leverage and permissiveness towards leverage on Wall Street. The second cause was a lack of financial controls and accountability. And personally, I still think there is a lack of financial controls. I think what happened in 2007 and 2008 could indeed happen again. The third issue is one I can't fix, and that's just good old-fashioned greed. Some people let their greed get ahead of their common sense, uh, and that was certainly a contributing factor in many ways. But whatever the cause, of the Great Recession, the bottom line is ordinary folk, ordinary Americans have been forced to watch really helplessly from the sidelines for about the last five years as jobs evaporated by the millions, as retirement security disappeared, as uh, opportunities for home ownership declined, and uh, it's something we're still struggling with today. Uh, not only did we see uh, these problems impact other, all, all of us, uh, you know, there were unforeseen consequences that we're just starting to see today. Uh, it wasn't just Wall Street that collapsed. Young people, anybody in here who has a, a, a college-age kid or a grandchild, uh, you know that the impact has been substantial for them, too. College debt has gone up through the roof. You're seeing an entire generation of young people start off their lives in debt. People in their 30s have negative net worths. This is a new thing for the United States of America, to be in your 30s and have a large portion of your cohort have a negative net worth. And it doesn't speak volumes towards optimism about their financial futures, their abilities to support a family. And as you look at some of the social trends that are taking place in our country, uh, more and more young people living in their homes with their parents, more and more young people choosing to defer major capital expenditures like houses and cars, more and more young people choosing to defer on social uh, arrangements like marriage. They all come back to this issue of economics and finances. The poor, the impoverished, were hit very hard by this recession. Here in the state of Oregon, we have 680,000 Oregonians living under the federal poverty line. 680,000. That's about $24,000 a year for a family of four. If poverty were a city in the state of Oregon, it would be our second most populous city. And of course, you've all heard that we're near the top of the list nationally in terms of hunger and homelessness. Those aren't things any of us are proud of. And it gets back again to this question of legacy. Is this the legacy that we are satisfied to leave? And I say no and hell no. And when I go out and I talk to people around this state, they're with me. They agree that we can and we will and we must do better going forward. So there's a couple of other issues that are that looks like a very healthy salad. Good for you. I don't usually eat that healthy. There's a couple of other issues that I think are important here uh, as well, and one of which is just to acknowledge the reality.
that Oregonians have succeeded when we've gone our own way, and when we've sat around and waited for other people to bail us out, we've not been very successful. The same holds true today. Uh, I just got back from a trip to Washington, D.C., and it's disturbing to me to walk through our nation's capital uh, I will actually confess, I walked through the barrier that somebody else had knocked out of the way. Maybe it was Sarah Palin. So I could go visit the FDR Memorial, which was closed. And it wasn't being maintained. And the fountains were turned off and they were clogged with leaves. And there was actually a red fox wandering through the FDR Memorial. I thought it was a sad statement. There were tourists from all around the world walking through, looking at the piles of leaves and the garbage that was stacking up in the FDR memorial. And I know what they were thinking because I was thinking the same thing, which is what happened to us? How did our federal government become so dysfunctional? My point being, we cannot rely on a dysfunctional Congress or a disinterested Wall Street to bail us out. We've got to chart our own course. And we have the wherewithal and the ability to do it here in the state of Oregon. There's a couple of things that we've been doing that I think warrant uh, optimism and hopefulness on the part of Oregonians. We've been leading an effort to find new ways to invest in critical long-term infrastructure, things like roads and bridges and airports and seaports. And we're leading the way by creating a first of its kind West Coast infrastructure exchange in partnership with the states of California and Washington and British Columbia. We've also been leading the way by acknowledging that the days of recruiting big companies to come to Oregon will still look for opportunities, but the reality is it's a lot harder now to recruit a big company to come to your state than it is to grow the companies that you already have. Somebody like that. Somebody hopefully who's in business. Thank you for being in business in Oregon. There are uh, many things that the legislature has undertaken in the last year to help support that. One of the most important was passing the Oregon Investment Act, which acknowledges we have to do a better job in this state of creating an environment in which innovation and technology-oriented companies in particular, but all businesses that have the opportunity to employ people at high levels of income, we need to support those companies in a much better way than we've been doing in terms of the services we provide and in terms of the financial resources that are available through the state. And we can also do a better job of helping private sector companies gain access to opportunities to invest in employers in this state. I think it's entirely appropriate for government, government to play a convening and a facilitating role in that arrangement to the degree that it helps get more capital to more businesses that are interested in growing. But there's one area I want to focus on today, in particular in my remarks, that gets us back to this issue of income growth and income disparity. Did anybody see the report that the state economist issued last week? And in that report, it said there's basically a new trend whereby there are two kinds of jobs in our Oregon economy. There are very high-skilled jobs, and there are very low-skilled jobs. The high-skilled jobs pay a lot. The low-skilled jobs don't pay very much at all. The jobs in the middle that used to be middle class jobs, those jobs are disappearing. Did anybody see that report? It's in the Oregon. I highly recommend you look it up. It was issued by the state economist. It's fascinating, and it also dovetails with this large discussion about what has gone on on Wall Street since the Great Collapse. What's gone on on Wall Street is Wall Street was bailed out, and Wall Street is back. I haven't checked the ticker in the last hour or so, uh, but Wall Street was on pace to reach an all-time high in the S&P 500, all-time record. And you've seen that many American companies are returning record profits today. And you've seen that many of the people on Wall Street who work there uh, and are closely associated with the financial services industry are receiving record bonuses. So Wall Street is back. 
But is Main Street back? No. And that report from the Oregon Economist just underscores it, that the middle class is being pinched. There was a Time Magazine article that came out three weeks ago, I believe now. The cover article was Wall Street One. Wall Street One. And that's disappointing to me. As the middle class struggles, as middle class jobs continue to disappear, we're seeing that the haves, compared to the have-nots, have more than they've had in generations compared to the have-nots. And when you look at the corporate sector, a sector I come from, a sector I work very closely with in my capacity as treasurer, you see the leaders in the corporate sector making earnings that are unprecedented relative to ordinary rank-and-file employees. Back in 1950, according to the SEC's, SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, the typical public corporation, large corporation CEO, made about 23 times their average rank and file employee. Today it's at about 204 times that. So Wall Street is back, record earnings. I'm just going to make this point. Wall Street is increasingly disconnected from what the fate of the middle class is. It wasn't always that way. When Wall Street did well, the middle class used to do well. That was a good thing. We were all related in the same economy. Too many people have forgotten a basic economic truth that has been with this country since the very beginning. And that basic economic truth has always been that the financial security of the middle class has defined the financial security for the nation. So here we are in Oregon. Lots of jobs that require skills, lots of jobs that do not require skills. Georgetown University took a certain look at this. They took a different look at the same issue of job fragmentation. This was just this last summer, six months ago. What they concluded, their Center on uh, Workforce Development and the Economy, they concluded that by the year 2020, 70% of the jobs in this country will require advanced education. 70%. They also drilled down by state. And Oregon was one of the states they identified as being disproportionately in need of advanced education. Or disproportionately having jobs that will require advanced education by the year 2020. And that's just because of the structure of our economy. We have lots of manufacturing, lots of high technology, lots of health care, lots of professional services. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It means we have the potential to be a high wage, high income state. We have the opportunity to counter all those sort of glaring statistics I mentioned earlier about poverty and hunger and homelessness in this state. And it's a little hard for us sometimes to get our, our arms around these big issues, but I really encourage you uh, to travel and see rural Oregon, particularly see uh, those parts of our state that are dependent upon natural resources. There are very high rates of unemployment, high rates of youth poverty, a lot of despair. And I think we in the urban area need to be more mindful of some of those economic needs in other parts of our state where people really are still suffering. Here's how we can help. Here's one thing that I want to leave you with today. On your ballot in 2014 is going to be a question referred to you by the state legislature at my request. The question will ask you, if you will support an initiative called the Oregon Opportunity Initiative. The Oregon Opportunity Initiative is an acknowledgement that the future of our economy is dependent in part upon the quality of our workforce. If Georgetown is right, if the Oregon Office of Economic Statistics is right about the fragmentation of jobs between high-skilled and low-skilled, then this is a way to counter that. This is a way for a state that's concerned about its per capita income growth 
to do something to turn the tide and help lift the economic prospects for our citizens. The Oregon Opportunity Initiative makes higher education more accessible and affordable, particularly to lower income and lower middle income students. It also seeks to reduce student debt and it seeks to increase vocational and technical training opportunities for people who either do not want or do not need to go to college, but still need those advanced skills to be employable. Why are we doing these things? We're doing these things because the cost of higher education in Oregon is becoming increasingly unattainable particularly for low and middle income students. Over a recent eight year period, the cost of higher education in the state of Oregon went up by 50% adjusted for inflation. Student debt has gone up 25% over a recent four year period. I mean, that's shocking and it's unsustainable. The cost to students and their families of higher education is going up at a much faster rate than household income growth is. It is not sustainable. Adding insult to injury is the reality that student aid in the state of Oregon is anemic. Student aid for low income and lower middle income students is anemic. We're number 46 in the nation in terms of our generosity towards student aid. When all of us were looking at higher education, advanced education, the state, the state's general fund, the taxpayers at large, paid a much higher proportion than they do today. And it's not because we as citizens are stingy, it's because the legislature has had other priorities. Over a period of many years, higher education in the state of Oregon has seen its funding diminish. I believe we're now 46th in the nation in terms of per capita contributions to higher education. Now, those of you who may be from the education sector, you know universities are pretty smart actors, right? They're smart, rational, economic actors. If they're getting less money from the state's general fund over a period of years, they do what any business would do. And at their core, they're a business. They may not want to say they are, but they are a business. And what they do, if they can't get revenues from the state's general fund, they get those revenues somewhere else. Where do they get them? Tuition. Fees and tuition. Correct. So there's been a cost shift. And we can go back 30 years and see a nearly dollar per dollar cost shift as the state legislature reduced its funding. Fees and tuition picked it up on the other side. Student aid anemic. Only one out of every five students who qualifies for Oregon's student aid plan based on need actually gets any funding at all. And they only get it for one year. There's no guarantee that you get it beyond one year. So some people might get it their freshman year but not get it their sophomore year. And what we're seeing is people don't finish their education or they greatly extend their education, raising the costs and their own personal debt. And my biggest fear is this, and there's data from Eco Northwest that backs my assumption. I can't prove this yet, but there's enough data to lead me to believe that I'm right enough that I'm going to tell you this. Because of the rapidly escalating cost of advanced education, and because of the decline in student aid over the last several years, I believe the students being left behind are predominantly lower income, lower middle income students from rural Oregon. One thing I can prove is that you look at free and reduced lunch rates across the state of Oregon, college participation is inverse to the rate a free and reduced lunch, meaning poverty means you are less likely to seek advanced education. If we are a state that is concerned about economic self-sufficiency and we want to grow income for our families and for our communities, then we need to do something to address this gaping hole in college participation, particularly amongst lower income and middle income students across the state of Oregon. But we also need to support vocational and technical training programs to acknowledge that there are A, jobs available in our economy, and B, young people who'd be glad to take those manufacturing jobs, but they need the skill set to be able to do it. So the Oregon 
opportunity initiative will be on the ballot in 2014, it will ask you a very simple question, which is, would you authorize the legislature to create an endowment dedicated to student aid and vocational and technical training? It's going to the ballot because it's going to be locked. It's going to be a constitutionally locked endowment, meaning the legislature cannot raid it for other purposes. The fund is intended to grow into perpetuity. How does it work? Uh, and I don't want to get into too many details, but I'm going to give you just enough to be dangerous. It's going to work the same way that the endowment works at Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, and MIT. Money will be put into a risk-managed, diversified pool, and it will grow with time. It will have years where it does really well. It will have years where it does really poorly. It will have periods of years where it does really well, and periods of years where it does very poorly. But the assumption is, over time, a professionally managed, diversified, risk-managed portfolio will grow at a rate greater than 0%. If it doesn't, we have bigger problems. <laughs> To give you a comparison, uh, the PERS fund over the last 30 years, even with the economic problems that we've had of late, has grown at about a 14% rate of return, just to give you an idea of what a professionally managed diversified portfolio can do over a long period of time. So that leaves the big question. How do you start this fund? Where do you get the resources to start it? The best option would be the one we know that the legislature won't do, which is to simply say student aid is a priority and we'll appropriate dollars directly into this endowment and grow it with time. But we already know that's not going to happen. Student aid has declined about 5% per year over the last seven years. So I've looked for what I think is the second best option, the most responsible from a financial perspective. And what I've come up with is an idea the idea is this, we take a small portion of our state's bonding capacity, our general obligation bonding capacity, and use it to seed the fund. Every biennium, this state issues about one to one and a half billion dollars in general obligation bonds. Those bonds are used for a variety of purposes bricks and mortar purposes. We build community college facilities, we expand our state's prison facilities, we invest in other kinds of projects that are deemed critical by the state legislature. What I'm asking is that for a short period of time, one biennium, we use a small portion of that one to $1.5 billion to seed the fund. The risk to taxpayers is exactly the same as if we invested in a building, in bricks and mortar. At the time we issue the bonds, the taxpayers, through the state's general fund, will support those bonds at a fixed rate of return for a 30-year period. It's the same as if we do a prison expansion or invest in a community college facility. That is the risk to taxpayers. The proceeds are then invested in this risk-managed, diversified portfolio that would be expected to grow with time. The mind-bender here, the mind-bender is using general obligation bonding capacity for something other than bricks and mortar. And so what I'm asking all of us to think about is isn't creating a permanent growing endowment dedicated to something this state absolutely needs for its economic success, which is education and vocational and technical training, isn't that endowment every bit as tangible as a building? I believe it is. And I believe it's in our economic long-term interests to do it. I think it's part of an important legacy that all of us could leave to future generations who at this moment are frankly holding on by their fingernails. They are holding on by their fingernails. This is an opportunity to turn the tide in 30 years from now to be able to say, in Oregon, 30 years ago, Oregonians decided to go in a different direction 
and rather than continuing to discount the value of higher education and vocational training, they instead chose to go in a different direction and create a permanent growing commitment to their economy, to their young people, to the skill sets they need, to the workforce development they need to be an economically competitive state. I hope 30 years from now the treasurer is standing here and not telling you anything about those statistics about declining per capita income growth or poverty or hunger or homelessness or unemployment or anything else. I hope they're standing there going, I'm really grateful to be an Oregonian because Oregonians took the lead and saw a promising opportunity and made an investment in their long-term economic prospects and they won. I'm going to leave you with that. I believe I'm obliged to answer questions. Yes, Is that please. correct? I'd be delighted. They'll uh, stack up over on the other side. Careful. Ted, thanks for being here. Oh, I appreciate sorry. it. Thank you. Yeah. Chairman Boland, Foreign Member, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So I am in the financial industry, so let me say your, your proposal another way. You're asking Oregonians to take on debt in order to finance an investment, correct? Correct. Okay. I would not advise that. So there must be another solution, right? So when you issued municipal bonds, when you guys all got your statements, you had all those bonds on there, you paid for those. So he's suggesting that they issue more debt and take the money and put it in an investment account and grow the money. I, I like the idea of an endowment. I'm just not sure that's the right way to do it. So I, I, any other solutions, or is that your only one? No, I have another solution. And first of all, I want to correct the premise. <laughs> I'm not asking you to issue more debt. That is, that is not correct. You're using well, debt the, the, fair enough, but let me answer the question. I'm asking you not to issue more debt. I'm asking you to take a portion of the debt that will be issued anyway by the state legislature. We determine how much debt capacity the budget has every biennium through the State Debt Policy Advisory Commission. The number is 5% of the general fund. 5% of the state's general fund <coughs> goes towards servicing state debt. It will be issued. We've issued, over the last 30 years, half a billion dollars to expand our prisons. <coughs> One could argue that that was a very important, prudent thing to do. Uh, we've remodeled the state capitol twice. One could argue those were very prudent. I'm asking you to take a portion of that debt that will be issued, that will be serviced through the state's general fund, instead use it for this endowment. Now I want to get to the investment side, because you, you ra Karen raised a fair question. There is something slightly different about this because I'm asking you to raise debt and pay for it out of the state's general fund and use it to create this diversified risk managed endowment. I would argue that that is no more a risky investment than using the proceeds to invest, say, uh, in a prison. For example, we have a prison here in the state of Oregon where we issued a lot of debt and we built it and it's never been used. Of course. It's never been used. Now, I guess that's good that it's never been used. That reflects crime rates. Uh, there have been other projects where the state has issued debt. There's a highway uh, down, it's a highway 20, I can't remember the, the highway that's currently falling down the hillside. Uh, that's a construction risk that always comes with bricks and mortar debt finance projects that this will not have. So uh, I'm simply saying I think we need to look at this as a prospect that for me makes perfect sense. The risk to the taxpayers is the same whether you're issuing it to build a building or whether you're issuing it to fund an endowment. Where it would be reckless, Karen, and where I would agree with you was if we were trying to service the debt out of the investment pool, and we're not. We're clearly separating the servicing side from the investment return side. Uh, she asked, is there a better way? Yes. And I was very clear about that up front. The better way, the smarter way, uh, the fiscally more prudent way would be to do what we have in Oregon never done, 
which is directly appropriate into student aid and vocational and technical training. We in Oregon, over the last 30 years, have gone in the opposite direction. We have actually defunded student aid and we eliminated vocational and technical training programs from our public high schools. So I just see this uh, maybe not as the perfect solution, but the best available today. Thank you, Karen. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve Buckstein, actually a new forum member. Uh, Lucky me, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> as you know, um, you know, I have a problem with your proposal, but yeah. um, the biggest problem, I think, and what I, uh, I hope you'd address and think about is that a big reason, I think, that student debt has gone up so much and that the cost of higher education has gone up so much is what's called the third-party payer problem. We're going to be seeing that with the Affordable Care Act here very soon, but when other people are paying the debt isn't going to go down for students, it's going to be transferred to other people. The, the debt, I think, for higher ed will actually be rising. Some students won't see that because it'll be subsidized. But given that fact, if you agree, even if you don't agree, I guess, do you have ideas or do you think there are legislators that have ideas to bend the cost curve of higher education down? I think there are ways in other states are doing it to dramatically reduce the cost of higher education, not costing taxpayers a dime, and making it more affordable to go to college. Yes, sir. Uh, and that's fair, Stephen. I do have I do have some ideas. Uh, and you may not like them, but they are ideas <laughs> nonetheless, and there are probably many others. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to slightly challenge the premise before I answer Steve's question head on. He is correct that there is national data that suggests if you look at higher education generally, the cost of higher education has been driven up uh, by investments in things that are colloquially called student services. Uh, read really fancy dormitories, uh, plasma TV screens, uh, sports facilities, other things that have actually driven up the cost of education. Uh, and nationally that's true. Uh, I couldn't find any good data in Oregon, so we actually went to the Oregon uh, university system and started culling through their data. We put our entire economic analysis up on the Treasury website and asked smart people and economists to check our homework. And so far, nobody has corrected us. What we've actually seen in the state of Oregon is that the universities have been very frugal. Uh, the cost per student of educating a student in the Oregon University student has actually remained relatively stable, adjusted for inflation over the last 30 years. So I'm, I'm gently questioning the, uh, the, the assumption underlying your question, Steve. But getting right to your question, there are many things we can do to reduce the cost. You saw the legislature grappling uh, with employee costs through PERS during this last legislative session. Uh, there are other things we can do in terms of using technology better and acknowledging that technology is a game changer in the higher education setting. Uh, the days where you pack 750 students into the Psych 101 Coliseum, uh, those days are probably behind us. There are ways that we can now use technology to engage students and encourage them and then focus the limited resources on lab space and other critical areas where you know students have to work together in a group setting. Uh, one idea that we've come up with, Steve, that I think is interesting is if you look at the cost of education that students are bearing, it's more typical now for a student to spend more than four years going through a university program. Sometimes it's five years or even six years. And that has an unintended cost consequence on the system. It means there's a seat that's available that's being filled by the same person longer, meaning then you have to take all of that great bonding capacity to build more facilities because they're bursting at the seams. If you could incentivize students to finish more quickly or on time, say you changed a portion of your student aid program to a forgivable loan, instead of calling it a grant, make it a forgivable loan. And if you graduate on time, it becomes a grant. And that has an added benefit to the taxpayer in that now that seat is available for the next person to come in. For those of you in the business community or in operations management, you know all about throughput. One of the easiest ways to reduce your capital expenditures is by increasing throughput. And so if there's a way to use incentives in the system to help get more people 
through the system, that might be another way, Steve, to reduce the cost. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Chris Leslie, poor member. Thank you, sir. You said the idea of uh, your return, was that for 2012 of 16%? No, sir. That that was a 30, it was 14% uh, for a 30-year period. Average. Average, correct. Yes, thank you. So there was in years and bad years and 14% is the average. Right. Yet, uh, I saw uh, one of the figures of your portfolio, the value was $56 billion in uh, 2011, and 2012 it was $75 billion. And the stock market, which you hate, I understand, uh, <laughs> seems to be doing about 30% uh, at least return year to date or more. She says 21. They're both good. Except yeah, I'm just a private investor, not a major. Last year. Last year. Last the question Last year. is, what is your year to date return on your portfolio? James, the last uh, rate of return on the portfolio was 12%, just over, it's like 12.1 something. Year to date. Year to date, correct, thank you. That's my one question. There you go. Yeah, and just, just a correction, uh, I do not hate the stock market. I want to be very clear about that, and that's part of why this is a tough conversation and why I brought it directly to you. Um, because Wall Street is bad, isn't a bad thing. The bad thing is that the American middle class is not bad. And the data just speaks for itself. If we are serious about protecting the middle class in this country, uh, and that's where most Americans are, most Americans, farmers, doctors, lawyers, whoever else, um, and we're all dependent upon the success of the middle class. And I'm just acknowledging what I see in the data. The jobs that support the middle class are disappearing. They're being outsourced, they're being downsized, uh, wages are being reduced, and the demand for higher education and skills training is going up. And we can be mad about it, but the reality is that's the reality. And what I'd like to see Oregon be is prepared for it, as opposed to mad at it. Yes, sir. Bill Kroger, forum member, I thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Interesting Hi. speech. I'm very impressed that you did that whole thing without any notes. So I just wanted to tell you to enjoy it while you still can, because when you get older, it doesn't happen. Like that. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to shift uh, gears for just a minute. Yeah. Uh, the great debacle in D.C. just recently with the government shutdown and the, uh, the debt ceiling issues. I'm sure, State Treasurer, you had to make some forward planning for you know, things. I'm just curious how it would have impacted us sure. and what you might have done. So the impact to the state is not that, was not that significant. The uh, Department of Administrative Services, the state economists, the Treasury and others came up with what we thought were best case guesses as to the impact on the state. In all likelihood, there would have been a continuation of resources for people who uh, were uh, financially needy, uh, and we had a, agreements from the federal government that they would pay forward those commitments, so there wasn't much of a concern there. My bigger concern was actually global. If the government shuts down, there is definitely a ripple effect in the U.S. economy. It's not just the lack of spending, it's what happens with interest rates. And we saw this in 2008, we saw it again in 2011. Brinksmanship on the debt ceiling, regardless of where you feel about the debt ceiling, is a bad idea. And recently, uh, I read the Financial Times that was talking about the impact that had already taken place in European economic markets as a result of just the threat of this escalation in interest rate yields. So uh, it, the government needs to understand that when you're playing with the reserve currency of choice on the planet, which is what you're doing when you're threatening to shut down the government and not fund things and not make good on certain debt payments and the repercussions throughout the economy, that was my bigger global concern. And it's still a concern. Kathy Stanton, foreign member. 
I have um, three kids paying off debt. Uh, so every couple of months I buy a lottery ticket hoping that I would put enough to get their college debt off the table. This is not a, um, a college debt or college financing question. This is going back to the, your beginning remarks about uh, investing in Oregon. Um, uh, you did not say it, but I was wondering what kind of funds are we talking about? Lottery funds or are we looking at um, tax credits or tax breaks for investment in either bodies or um, capital for businesses. Uh, because for me, um, as much as Karen has her very legitimate for her concerns uh, regarding um, using bonding for investing, I am quite concerned about foregoing taxes that can be used to provide services to um, existing Oregonians across across the board, especially those in, in need. So um, assuage my fears and tell me that you are not looking at reducing taxes uh, to, to the benefit of corporations, LLCs, partnerships, single owner, I don't care how small the small business is. I need to know what kind of disinvestment lack of taxes uh, to provide services for the rest of us. Okay, I, I'm going to take a swing at this. I may not have heard the kernel of it, so if you could stay up there just in okay. case I, I didn't get the kernel of it. Uh, various tax exemptions and credits in the state of Oregon are significant when it comes to the overall state budget. The last statistic I saw uh, from the state's legislative fiscal office uh, it was something like 39 cents on every dollar assessed is actually taken in because the rest is absorbed through various credits and other exemptions. Yes, so we don't get. Right. And so what the legislature did, not this session, but two sessions ago, was they asked for a credit by credit and exemption by exemption review. Well, they, of, su they sunset it. Yes, they did. That's correct. They sunset, so they all come before the legislature through a special committee, and they're all reviewed in terms of does the credit do what the credit was intended to do? Is it a successful program? Is it achieving its goals? And is it a credit that we as a legislative body want to continue? So I feel much better about the process that the legislature has put into place in terms of accountability. The proposal that we've put on the table to fund higher education and vocation. No, no, no. This is the very first part of your remarks, which was not about higher education. It was about investing in Oregon in businesses for for. Um, for jobs. Right. Uh, that would be the Oregon Investment Act, and there was no tax credits that went into that. That was lottery dollars that were already being used for a different program. Yeah, I Oregon understand program. OIA and, and bonding and okay. lottery, but what, what I heard I you say that you were working, you wanted to work to get more jobs here in Oregon to, to invest in new companies or in existing companies. And my question is, that sounds good. I need to know it's not being, it, the investment is not coming out of tax credits no. or tax uh, breaks. Correct. So that the money is not there for the other programs that we no, are in the state. Not at all. No, these are dollars that are already in place <clears throat> that will be issued through private sector partners that are experts when it comes to supporting uh, business development. An example might be a loan participation program where the state of Oregon extends a loan to a business, but they do so through a private sector bank or a credit union. Okay, thank so you. So no credits, no exemptions, uh, nothing like that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Hello, Harry. Harry Woody, former member. Good to see you. Two-part question. Yes, sir. Uh, as I understand it, prior to 1933, the state of Oregon levied a property tax to finance the state government. That was one of the primary methods of financing the state government was the property tax. And there's a provision in the Constitution that says if the state can't pay its bills, a property tax will be levied on every piece of property in the state to pay off the debt. I presume that. I think it's still there. And my, my question is that uh, what is the total debt of the state of Oregon? 
The total debt of the state of Oregon today is about $12 billion, and that includes contingent liabilities through ODOT and other, other government jurisdictions. The direct debt owed by the state itself, I think, is about $3 billion, a little under $3 billion. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Harry, I'm not aware of the property tax. So it is, it is allowed to, to pay off general obligation bonds if necessary. The state can uh, tax property throughout the state to pay general obligation bonds only. Good. Thank you, Harry. Yes, sir. Patrick, we really a former member, no relation. <laughs> so, <laughs> One lost cousin. <laughs> My bias is that higher education is dealing with technologies of yesterday. And we've got too damn many attorneys been cranked out of the schools and it's gone crazy. But anyways, um, how are you going to make sure that uh, the universities are doing tomorrow's technology, teaching tomorrow's technologies, and not yesterday's? That is a fair question, Mr. Wheeler. The the way that this bill was structured by the legislature was they do not allow the state treasurer to enact any policy with regard to education because we are not qualified to enact any policy with regard to education. So what we are doing is creating a funding vehicle and a source of funding and then we would leave it to people on what's now called the Higher Education Coordinating Commission to run the student aid program the way they see fit based on their universe of educators uh, and student aid experts and business people and the like. They are in the process of taking a look at the entire student aid program and asking, is it structured the right way? Does it have the right incentives? Is there an opportunity to increase investments in programs like science, technology, engineering, and math? Is it time for the state of Oregon to include critical degrees that are uh, related to the jobs that we have in this state. All of those are questions that will be asked by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission over the next year. Uh, as state treasurer, I will not be part of that process. Yes, sir. Al Falcone, forum member. Certainly an informative presentation today. We certainly really appreciate you coming over here and taking Thank you. your time. I appreciate uh, it. You had mentioned that the rising cost in the universities now, with high-tech equipment, flat-screen TVs, computers, so on and so forth. Now, all the money that is donated to these schools through sports programs, and I mean, former alumni, big donors, so to speak, okay? Is this money properly used in these universities by the people working there, the professors, this type of thing? Are they fat cats living off the land? If you could just comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I will. And I'm getting a little bit over my skis, but I enjoy doing that anyway, so I'll continue. Uh, first of all, I want to be clear. I was talking nationally. The data in Oregon, at least as we posted on our website, we encourage people to take a look at it, question it, poke holes in it if you want. Uh, it's been there for the better part of a year. Suggests that in Oregon, the university system has done a pretty good job of keeping its costs under control. In terms of whether or not uh, the universities are using those dollars and the technology wisely, that is a very broad question, and everybody's going to answer it differently. Uh, I would give you the story of the athletic student facility down at the University of Oregon, funded by Phil Knight. He brought it in for a very specific purpose. He paid for it. Uh, it was private sector dollars that were raised to support it. Uh, and still, it's come under a lot of criticism from people who say sports should not be the focus of an academic institution. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, my personal view is if Phil Knight wants to build the Uni University of Oregon, uh, a building in the university says they need it, go for it. Um, that said, I do criticize the university system for being very slow to adapt the opportunities around technology. There's a lot of institutional inertia in the university system, just as there is in Salem. And all of these new technologies have opened up new windows to learning that do not require a student to even be in the same state. Uh, I have an entire program on my phone called iTunes University. 
And I can listen to lectures from all around the world from some of the most noted academics in the world, and it doesn't cost me a cent. All I have to do is have a long commute, which I do. Uh, and this is one example of, you know, I hate to use the word game changer too much, but this undercuts the entire economic model of the university system as it currently exists today. And the reality is those systems are going to have to figure out how to use technology smarter and then focus the resources where they know they need to invest. There is a critical shortage of technology and lab space in our universities and our community colleges today. That's an area where we could invest more if we were investing less in these gigantic lecture halls that frankly are a thing of the past for many of the courses that are traditionally taught in those large lecture hall environments. That, that would just off the top of my head be my answer to that. Yes, sir. John Weaver Forum member. Thank you, John. Ted, thank you for an outstanding program. Thank you, sir. My question is on a totally different subject. Yes, sir. I am interested in the percent of the state's retirement funds that are invested with hedge funds and money market managers, and what kind of a return and what kind of hazard do we have concerning those funds? Excellent question. Uh, with regard to money market, the percentage is actually very low at this point. It's less than 10%, uh, and that's the liquidity in the portfolio that we need for the retirement system, and the returns are very poor. Uh, as you know, money markets right now are returning somewhere in the vicinity of 0.11%. Uh, they have a very low rate of return. Uh, those of you who are invested in retail money market funds, you may actually be losing money once you calculate in the fees. And that's by virtue of the fact that the Federal Reserve has pursued an artificially low interest rate environment, which, by the way, makes it an expeditious time to issue bonds. Because if you're going to get nailed on the return side of the equation, why not take advantage of it on the debt side of the equation? I'm not saying go hog wild with debt, but there's some prudent level of leverage in an artificially low interest rate environment that makes sense. And that's part of why we settled on the bonding piece as one potential source of funding for the Oregon Opportunity Initiative. In terms of hedge funds, in terms of hedge funds, uh, virtually, uh, I think we have a grand total of two million out of an eighty. Two funds. Two funds. Uh, um, uh, maybe, a, maybe a fifty million out of eighty million. A, a very small percentage in hedge fund. The state of Oregon has not been an enthusiastic participant in the hedge fund environment, sir. Good. <laughs> yes, sir. Lee Coleman, uh, forum member. Good to see you. Uh, the, the, the referendum about which you spoke. Uh, appears to me to be intended to benefit university students only. And my question is, why not students at tech school level, not university level? And, and if not, why not? Thank you. I, I was not clear then, because it is absolutely uh, for all of the current qualified institutions for the Oregon Opportunity Grant, which is including universities, and community colleges. So when I say advanced education, I'm including both of those. And it also creates a vehicle specifically to support technical and vocational training programs. Terrific. A lot of those will happen at the community college level in partnership with private sector partners, but there is no exclusion for a pure technology school uh, to be included. The dollars will go towards the students and the Higher Education Coordinating Commission gets to determine which of those students are eligible. Uh, so it, it, the gist of your, your point is exactly where I am on this. We, we absolutely need to focus on the technology and the skill set that you need for economic growth. Yes, sir. Chris Leslie, four member, again. Thank you, sir. Since 1999, uh, Oregon spent over a hundred million, well, almost a hundred million, ninety-nine million dollars on startups. What is, I mean, are they political uh, or anything, or what are the good startups that you have and brag about? Well, I hope to be able to brag about one uh, in the coming weeks. 
uh, the state of Oregon through its pension system, through a private equity investment that we made, is an er was an early investor in Twitter. And I'm not going to pop any champagne corks because I saw what happened to Facebook. Um, and so I, I'm, count me skeptical but hopeful. <laughs> Uh, the state of Oregon did also create a carve out back in, I think it was the late 1990s, I think I want to say 96 or 97 specifically, a $100 million carve out from the state's pension plan to invest in early stage technology investments in the state of Oregon. And I can tell you, at best, it has been marginally successful. Geographically, it was too constrained. Uh, in terms of the requirements that the legislature put on it, it was too constrained. We are a global investment portfolio. Uh, we invest all around the world in virtually every asset class that has been created. Uh, we're in every sector of the economy globally that you can think of. And so I, I think in hindsight, I'll say that it was a mistake for the legislature to put too narrow a hoop around those dollars with too many restrictions. You have uh, 20 domestic advisor money managers. Uh, internationally, you have at least 20 advisors, managers. Yes, sir. And three globally. Well, one you just got rid of. But vocational schools over universities, wouldn't that be a better idea these days? It, I think hand in hand. Uh, they're both good ideas today. But where we have seen our investments in the state of Oregon, we defunded vocational and technical training. And here we are in a state that has a lot of manufacturing and a lot of technology. And those skills are absolutely critical to both of those sectors of our economy. So I think it was penny wise and pound foolish for us to have disinvested from vocational and technical in the first place. And that's part of the imperative to passing the Oregon Opportunity Initiative, is we can sit around and talk about increasing funding for vocational and technical training, but the reality is we've been talking about it for 30 years and moving in the wrong direction. So even though there are aspects of my proposal which I know people are not enthusiastic about, I defy you to come up with a better plan. And if you come up with a better plan that can actually get enacted, I'll get behind it. But until I see that plan and I haven't seen it, I'm going to push this one 100%. Yes, sir. Last question. Uh, John McLeod, just for a member. Um, I'm thinking about money, and uh, Washington won't participate. Uh, can Oregon afford to put a bridge across the Columbia? Oh, boy. Ending with a puffball. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. The, uh, <laughs> Oh, look at the time. <laughs> so is it going to happen? Uh, here, here's, here's my assessment. On September 26th, I sent a letter to the legislative leadership at their request outlining my concerns about the current proposal that is in front of the legislature around the Columbia River crossing. I guess I wouldn't call them concerns as so much requirements. If we are to issue bonds in support of an Oregon-led Columbia River Crossing project, there are a lot of things that need to fall into place. And I listed in my letter, and it's available on the Treasury website, what I think those things are. Some of the requirements have been met. For example, the Coast Guard has signed off on the height of the bridge. That was a major obstacle that's now been addressed. They have to reach an agreement on how they're going to pay for the mitigation of the businesses upriver from the bridge. Uh, the ones that concern me the most, though, are really related to the notion that we've changed the dynamic of the deal. The deal before was Oregon and Washington were going to share the financial risk for this project. Once Washington decided not to support it, and they've left Oregon with it, now if we're going to build this bridge, there's no shared financial risk. There's not a financial shared arrangement. It's a legal arrangement. And a legal arrangement is fundamentally different than a financial arrangement where you share risk. In a legal arrangement, what we need to have is assurance that we can negotiate a legally enforceable deal with the state of Washington that will be in place 
for the entire life of the bonds that guarantee us that Washington State will go after Washington drivers who refuse to pay their tolls. In the absence of that arrangement, we should not spend another dime on this project. And we should not issue bonds in support of it because it's not financially viable without that legally enforceable tolling reciprocity agreement. In addition, we need to be able to ensure that Oregon controls the rates of the tolls. Toll rates are your backstop against cost overruns or revenue shortfalls or if too many drivers decide to go to I-205 to avoid the, the bridge or if interest rates go through the roof. Our only backstop to protect taxpayers would be increasing the tolls. And so another concern I've listed is that Oregon needs to have unilateral control over those tolling agreements. Uh, it's my understanding that the legislature will have a hearing on November 5th. I intend to participate. I'm going to tell them I think it's a really important project. I'm going to tell them I understand the economic imperative behind it, that I understand why we need a new crossing. But I'm also going to tell them until those requirements have been met, do not expend another dime and do not issue additional debt. Because those are requirements for us to be able to responsibly issue debt in support of that project. No matter how good the project is, it has to make sense financially. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you'll have me back. You may not want to. But I hope you have me back. We'll have you back. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Folks, I'd like to briefly close the format and remind you we've got WashingtonCountyForum.org. We also have a podcast at WashingtonCounty.Podomatic.com. Uh, one last thing, we have a Twitter account at WCForum.com. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next week.